Our scripture lesson this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, beginning in the 11th chapter at the 16th verse. Listen for God's word for you this morning. And Jesus said, but to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they said, He has a demon. Then the Son of Man came, eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, Because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such is your gracious will. All these things have been handed over to me by the Father. And no one knows the the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As Jesus is speaking, he uh, begins to want to say what they, they are as a generation, wants to describe them. And um, I was thinking about this in our own culture. Um, we are such a, a fractured culture that there's hardly anything you can say about us clearly. Um, we have all different kinds of political beliefs. Um, we, from different ages, one of the things we've learned is by generational uh, groups, you can characterize who we are, but even those are not clear. Uh, the things that you would say about baby boomers are not entirely fitting for the whole of baby boomers or Generation X or Millennials or any of the generations that they'll want to describe. Um, Each of them have some truth, they carry a bit of truth, but then you take all those together and you try to characterize who a generation is. While we are involved in so many different things and believe in different uh, agendas in our life, I think there's one thing that seems pretty true about us. Uh, We seem tired. Uh, I think culturally we feel tired. As I look around, it feels a bit like the way Jesus said, um, like children calling out, uh, we we, uh, played the flute for you, but you would not dance, and we mourned, we wailed, and you would not mourn. Um, A generation that's kind of tired of so much, uh, living busy lives, Our lives are incredibly busy, fuller than they've ever been before, and yet we find ourselves wanting to pull back and rest more. Um, Almost kind of grumpy. Have you ever looked at yourself and noticed that about yourself, becoming a bit grumpy? I I see that in myself. I I thought it was all reserved for that next-door neighbor when I was growing up. Mr. Pruitt was the grumpiest man I knew. Um, you know, it, it, it could not step in his yard, could not do anything. And there was this imaginary line that, where you could see that the two different yards were mowed just a little bit differently. Could not cross it or else it'd be trouble. I think I've told you the story about um, whenever Mr. Pruitt came over to talk to my dad. And uh, he said, your son had thrown these nails into my yard. And he had like three nails that he found in his backyard. And... and uh, my dad said, no, that one's not one of mine, and those two I threw over the fence. So, 
And he was just a grumpy, grumpy old man. There wasn't much in his life that he was happy about. But what scares me is I hear myself talking sometimes, and I sound grumpy. I, uh, oh, I don't know that I want to go and stay out that late anymore. Um, you know, oh, the music will be too loud. Or, oh, gosh, you know, it's on Saturday, and it's one day when I don't have to do something in the church, and yet I spent yesterday working on the next Emmaus walk. And, and you know, getting up on Saturday morning to go do that, I, I hate but once I get there, I'm glad I've done it. You know, it was good for me. I, I had a good experience at it, but I couldn't wait till it was over so I could get home and get to some peace and quiet, you know. Um, they're, they're just, we fill our lives so full of activity. And, and sometimes we find ourselves at that place, one more ball game to have to go to, one more of this or that. Can't we just stay home today? Why do we have to go to church today? Can't we just, you know, it's the only day we don't have anything going on. Let's just stay home. Uh, maybe, maybe you don't ever get that way. I hope you don't. Uh, but I hear it in myself. And I see it in some of you. I don't see it in all of you. Some of you, I, I wish I could be as uh, joyful as the way I see you to be in your life. I, it's just not my makeup. Um, I'm not going to beat myself up about it. But uh, some of you just live with great joy, and I see that, and that's, that's wonderful. But Jesus is looking at a generation who seems so tired, and they just want to back away and, and, and just have some time down for themselves. Um, maybe they scheduled their vacation so full that when they got home, instead of being refreshed, they were just tired, and they looked at all the laundry that had to be done, and then they had to get back to work the next day, and it just, you know, was it really worth it to go away? Because all the stuff that has to be caught up on, um, you know, we just kind of grumpy sometimes because we can't find our place of rest. Jesus says, John came, and man, he was straight-laced, and no one liked him. Uh, and then the Son of Man comes, and he's having parties and drinking and eating, and they say a glutton and a sinner. I mean, can, nobody can make you happy, right? You know, you don't like it if it comes one way or like, like it another way. And, uh, and sometimes it's just, it's, we just find that place where we're so discontent, we're so tired. One of the interesting phenomenons, I, I know you've noticed it, um, in, in previous eras. We have this idyllic image of America where we lived out on our front porches and we greeted our neighbors. Now no one wants to go to the front porch. They build on great gazebos and everything in the backyard because we don't want to have to mess with anybody else. We want this private space so we can come and relax and be on our own this place of seclusion. We build it in our backyards. I noticed one of our neighbors put a bunch of lawn furniture out in the front yard, and I thought, isn't that interesting? Because it's exactly the opposite of what the trends are today, that we're moving to more and more private, and yet they put all the stuff out in the front, creating a public space for gathering. I thought it was interesting to, to notice. I don't know if it's a trend or just one person who's just bucking the trends, uh, but maybe... Maybe there's something that, uh, that we, we should be looking for, something more outwardly oriented in relationship to others. Um, what I know is uh, Jesus is calling us to not live in that place of grumpiness. Um, and we live in it short attention span. Uh, go any place. I mean, there aren't too many places in, in Chickasha you can go and that there's an elevator to wait on. But go anywhere where there's an elevator and just watch people push the button and see how impatient they get waiting for the elevator to come. I mean, people start pushing it and pushing it again because it hadn't gotten there quick enough. And you know, the elevator we have is not the speediest one here. You know, if when you push the button, you're going to wait a little bit to get there. Um, I, every time I do it, I think, oh, I, I should have just taken the stairs. You know, it would have been as fast. Um, we, we have a hard time waiting. Because we've been programmed to be so busy and to be so active and things happening constantly. Our attention pan, uh, spans growing shorter and shorter. I find it harder and harder to finish a book these days because I'm, I'm more used to reading articles that are quick, 
something on the internet, read it page two at the most, and you're done, and take the point, and you move on. It's harder to sustain that kind of interest. We live in a world that has uh, been there, done that, not sure I really want to go back again. Um, kind of tired. And so we come today to, to see that, that that's not the place where we want to live the whole of our life. Um, it's okay to get tired. What's not okay is to become cynical. To let tiredness and boredom um, lead us to a place where we become cynical about our life and about the world. Uh, it's interesting. Jesus says this, this verse about, uh, like children saying, we play the flute and you would not dance. And we mourn. Or we wail and you will not mourn. It's kind of the ends of our celebration of life, isn't it? Uh, music and dancing like at a wedding and celebration and mourning and wailing like at a funeral. The whole spectrum of our life kind of caught up between those two. And, uh, and we even seem tired with those. St. Augustine was a, a, a man who spent his life searching he, at the end, gets the name saint. That's the only way you get it is at the end. Um, but if you read his book, The Confessions, you, it, which is probably one of the first religious autobiographies, and it really is a fascinating book to read. Uh, it, it, you think, oh, St. Augustine. It, it, he was a pretty wild guy as a young guy. And he goes through episodes of how he was a, a womanizer, how he was a drunkard, all these things about his life of, that he went through, kind of searching for meaning in his life. And, 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 and in that book, there's this amazing phrase that says, um, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee, O Lord. Our hearts are restless until we find our rest in him. He spent his whole life searching for all his meaning, and he's a great philosopher. He studied, he, uh, he did so many different things, and yet it was only when he came to the place of understanding Christ in his life that, that he really began to understand that our life is really designed to be in him. And when we live our life with him, we, we live it with a sense of meaning and purpose, and we're no longer restless like that. We have a sense of peace about our lives. But in our world, people are hungry and restless, and because of that, they've become bored and tired. They've worn themselves out in search of meaning in all the wrong places, that the one place where we could truly find it is in Christ where we allow ourselves to, to find that rest and that sense of peace. And when we do, it really changes everything about how we live. It allows us to move from the been there, done that cynicism to an openness to life. That kind of searching, um, Paul Tillich was a, a brilliant theologian, um, during the 50s and 60s, he shaped much of uh, church theology. And, and he talked about this searching within ourself. He used the word concupiscence. I'd never heard it until I was reading him. And this, this word concupiscence, what, he, what it really means is a desire to consume the world. Isn't that amazing? A desire to consume the world. Everything out there. Just one more, give me one more variety of it. What, try one more thing. That, that there's this desire within us, a hunger within us, that will keep us searching till we try everything in the world until we try and we find the one thing that we're really in need of. And it's the thing that we've known since the beginning. It's our place in Christ. I, I think it's such a beautiful thing, and I, I don't know that there's any other way to do it except the way we do it in our life, that, um, that we are, when we are created, when we were created, we're created in goodness, and yet immediately fallen. And so the goodness of, of who God created us and designed us to be is within us, and the brokenness of sin 
is within us. And we wrestle with these two parts of ourselves, moving, hopefully, as we do through life, less away from the brokenness of sin to the place of our original destiny and creation in Christ. And that's the place where we're supposed to be. Um, He's on my mind a lot this week, partly because we're preparing for the next walk to Emmaus, and um, partly, uh, well, mostly that. And then at, at breakfast, uh, he came up in my mind again as some of us were sitting around talking. Um, when we went to uh, Pawnee, uh, believe it or not, my sermons were a little longer than they were used to, and the uh, services went kind of long. And there was a fellow in the church, Bryce Privet. And Bryce, he was an old curmudgeon. I mean, he was, he was kind of grumpy about everything. Uh, Bryce and, and Glenn Lyons owned the Pawnee Bill Trading Post. And uh, Glenn was about as easy going as you could ever imagine. He was a full colonel in World War II. Um, uh, he was just easy going, nice guy. Uh, they owned this company together. Bryce was never happy, uh, never satisfied, always pushing. And so they would, you know, the trading posts, they sold Indian, Native American goods all over the country. But in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, they had another office. And so during the big season there, uh, Bryce and Irma would move to, uh, to Gatlinburg, and they would be there throughout the summer until in fall whenever everything closed up, and then they would come back, and they would be fall through the winter into spring, uh, in Pawnee. And so my sermons were going kind of long, the worship service was going kind of long, and everybody just said, just wait till Bryce gets back, you know, he'll, he'll straighten you out. And uh, because his, his philosophy was, and he used to do this in the old day, if the, ser- the sermon went long, the service went long, he would stand up and back and he would point to his watch, you know, make sure that the pastor knew that it was over time. And uh, and, and so the day came when Bryce returned, September. And, you know, I'd been ready for him and everything, and we went through the service. I didn't get a chance to talk to him before and after the service was over. And I said, I guess we didn't go too long. Um, everybody had been warning me and telling me, you'd, you know, stand up and let me know if the service went long. And, and he said, Scott, you know, they all talk about that, but that's the old Bryce. He said, there's a new Bryce now. And over in Gatlinburg, he got connected with the group over there that he went on the walk to Emmaus over at Lake June, Alaska. And he said, everything changed for me by going on the walk. Um, I had a faith that was there, but it really, it was kind of dormant. And when I went on the walk to Emmaus, it just brought it back to life. And uh, he said, I'm just a different person now. I don't care. He says, you talk as long as you want to. And it won't bother me. The thing this morning we were talking about is that as a church, we used to have a carol on that played. And we talked about the different places over at the college. They've got one. The Catholic Church rings their bell. And the different things around town that are that way. Bryce, the thing that reminded me this morning is um, when I'd gone to Pawnee, people tell funny stories in churches, whether they're really true or not, to get done what they wanted to get done or not get done. I was at a church one time when people, the guys on the trustees did not want to put in a parking lot. And so they gave this astronomical cost of what it would take to put in, uh, you know, instead of the gravel that was there, to put in asphalt. And it seemed so big, no one would be willing to ever try it. And, and it scared people off about thinking about the idea for a long time until I called up a few companies and had them come in and give us estimates and it was a lot cheaper than what anyone had ever imagined and they were able to take it on and they did it and the story was over well in the Pawnee church the, there was a, a sign that had been put on the the, the rope for the uh, the bell there it says do not pull unsafe and uh you know, it was just, just a little tag that was put on there, and then it was hung up real high against the wall so none of the kids could ever pull on it. And, um, 
And I, I thought, you know, I wonder what's really, you know, people would ask me, why is the bell, why won't it work? And I'm, I don't know. I just got here. You guys have been here a lot longer than me. And, but my curiosity got me. So I one day climbed up into the attic and got up there to where the bell was actually hanging. It was as solid as a rock. I mean, it was, it was in there. There was nothing unsafe about it. And so Bryce asked me, he said, well, why don't we ring the bell? He, and I said, well, I don't know. There's not a good reason why not. And uh, he, Bryce didn't like getting there early in the morning, so he didn't want to ring it at the beginning. But he uh, wanted to have it rung at the end of the service. So Bryce would get the kids out of Sunday school right if the service was closed. And he would take them upstairs to the room. And he would have them pull on the bell at the end of the service. So as the service was ending, the bell would ring out all across town. Well, that was Bryce just wanted, it was just a celebration for him. He thought that was great, you know, to do it. And, uh, and this new Bryce, that was, you know, what was really important to him. After a couple of weeks, um, right across the street from us is the Baptist church, kind of the way it is here. The, the pastor at the Baptist church came over to my office. He said, Scott, I've got a favor to ask. Would you quit ringing the bell when you get out of service? Because you all finish about 10 minutes before we do. And my people just, they, they can't stand it when they hear your bell. And they know that you're getting out and already getting to the restaurants. And, uh, you know, would, would you just not ring the bell at the close of the service? And I said, you know, if it were just me, I'd happily do that. But this is Bryce. And this is Bryce's joy. So I'm not going to ask him not to ring the bell. Um, when we find our joy in our life, it changes how we live. Uh, when we get our place of rest in Christ, it changes our attitude about everything. Um, I know a lot of you have been on the walk to Emmaus. Most of you have. Some of you haven't. If you haven't, um, I'm going to be working the men's walk this year. Um, Cindy, you're working the women's walk. Um, we, we, we try to keep people involved in that each time. It would be wonderful if you've not been on the walk, if we can help you to do that this year. Um, we'd, we'd love to make it happen. There, there are people in the church who would love to sponsor you to do it. Um, if you haven't been on it, this, I think this would be a great opportunity for you to do so. Um, I know that Alex and Rachel, our new associate minister and wife, they're planning on going on the, the walk this year. Um, so we'll we hopefully get a number of people in the church to participate in it. And, 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 it, and it really is a place of real spiritual renewal. It's a place where you can come to know Christ at a deeper level, and you can find that rest if you find yourself in a place of weariness. It's where we remember that fourth commandment, um, which is to honor the Sabbath, to find our place of rest in Christ. And then in doing so, we discover um, that we are valued by Christ, not because of what we do, but just because of who we are. That he loves us just because of who we are, not because of what we do. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to do anything. We just have to receive it. And then when we live in that place, we can know that we are Christ and that we can bear the yoke that he has for us because it's easier, it's lighter than any burden we'll carry in this world. And we'll load ourselves up just left to our own. We'll, we'll load ourselves up with burdens that we don't need to carry. Christ will take for us and he will let us carry his yoke, which is all that we are designed to be. It's like finding your niche whenever you find your place in Christ. It really is that ability to let yourself go in him. As we uh, come to this place in the service, I invite you to just take a deep breath. And just let out all that anxiety that you ever felt in your life. And breathe in Christ's rest and Christ's spirit. And let it change how you view this world. Amen.